Hi, I'm Malcolm Young, the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California, and thanks for watching the Forum Online. Can words change us? Can poetry really help us to understand and appreciate the world? Poetry's strength lies in its ability to shed a sideways light on the world so the truth can sneak up on you. Poetry can teach us how to live. It bears open the vulnerabilities of human beings so that we can all relate to each other a little better. Brought up in the South Carolina low country, my guest Atsura Riley is the author of Herd Hoard, which McSweeney's called the essential collection of our moment, what we've needed most without knowing it. His first collection, Romy's Order, was the winner of the Winning Writers Award, the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, the Believer Poetry Award, and the Witter Binner Award from the Library of Congress. U.S. Poet Laureate K. Ryan says of Riley, quote, he's pursuing something a lot more ambitious that has deeply to do with sacred properties of language or language that could cast a spell against harm. Each year, the cathedral chooses a theme for inspiration and reflection, and in 2021, our theme is healing. Tonight, we're talking about poetry and the healing power of words. Atsuro, it's so nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's my great pleasure, Malcolm. I'm so happy to be here. So many guests that we have are, are total strangers to me. Um, and so I, I kind of have to kind of warm them up. I just have to kind of establish that I'm someone who you can be relied on. I'm not going to try to embarrass them, et cetera. And I'm so grateful to have such a close friend on the forum because it means we can just get right cut right to the chase. And I can ask you, you know, questions out of the gate that I would never ask another poet or another guest. Fire so away. I'm glad. I, I wonder if you've gotten this question before you may have. What word pictures help you to understand God? That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose um, what I'd say is all word pictures. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you think about the music of poetry, the music, the, the, the practice of making a poem, um, to me, that's a kind of, uh, on the one hand, you know, mental, emotional, psychic, um, uh, working out of something, of making a pattern. But on the other hand, and I'm inclined to think in these terms, given my upbringing, on the other hand, it's a simple act of making, you know, it is the digging of a well or the throwing of a pot or the planting of the tomatoes for the season and so on, right? It's uh, making a cabinet. Um, and so, um, and I take those, all of those practices to be holy, to be, to be salvific, to be in touch with God. Um, and again, I'm inclined to think in those terms because of my upbringing. I did not have a religious upbringing, but I did have a working class upbringing in which doing a thing, making a thing, pouring your attention into the thing, paying attention to the world, um, you know, the bark and the wood and the grain of the wood and making, um, making this raw material given to us by God, given this, uh, taking this raw material, which is a given of the earth, and then making something out of it is a holy thing. So um, to get back to your question, word pictures, um, you know, if we think of a poem as a word picture, I tend to think of kind of word picture music. Right. Uh, right. Course, um, so yes. word picture music and the music being the pattern making that I'm talking about, that in itself is a holy thing. Um, and boy, I, from my own practice, I have never felt as sure um, and have never felt as close to or have never felt less doubt um, than when I am making something. I, you know, I absolutely love what you say just because it's, it's so perfect because you know, I read a poem as a consumer of poems. Of course, you read a poem as a, as a creator of poems. And I know exactly what you mean. It's um, that something, you know, I, I just, you know, every year of my, like my life as a, as a priest, I've basically been pressed 
harder and harder because I need to produce more and more every year. Um, and this year is more than I've ever, ever. And so I, I just, I, you know, you start, and you, it, there's a blank piece of paper in front of you. You just don't know where anything's going to come from. And it comes from something that's not you. And it's not like I'm like dictating what God wants me to tell everybody at all. But there is in creating something, there's a way in which you discover something that's coming from somewhere else. And, and I, 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 you know, and you're right, when you're making a cabinet or planting tomatoes, um, you, you, you get a glimpse of that too. Um, I, 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 I wonder too, just, you know, I, I didn't think of this earlier as a follow-up question, but just, you know, there, there are those kind of moments of kind of spiritual dryness or um, spiritual despair, you know, moments of, of doubt, moments, moments of hopelessness. And, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just how poetry connects and relates to those human experiences too. Well, um, first of all, I mean, spiritual dryness is a close cousin to creative dryness, right? Yeah. And a, a dry patch um, in your own personal field can then lead to spiritual, uh, a spiritual kind of drought and vice versa, right? So that's a, a sad situation. And then, of course, you're looking for, you're desperate for anything, right? any way to kind of, I was talking to a friend, a poet um, uh, in the past week, and um, we were trying to figure out ways for him to f trick himself into falling into the, what we call the golden rabbit hole, right? The golden rabbit hole of making something, of thinking about something, of uh, trying to solve a, you know, in his case, a metrical musical problem, um, and that that would be a way to, you know, in the plainest possible terms, feel better, uh, get more in touch with oneself, feel more alive, feel more connected, and so on. Um, you know, what can I say about, uh, uh, you know, a kind of spiritual drought? Uh, there are certainly, there are certainly poems, works of art in general, one of the things we know about works of art that make them reliable is that now and again, a work of art in the same way that the liturgy or some religious ritual or some excellent, careful, fingertip control pastoral care, such as you give, um, there are many ways to get out of the out of the predicament there are many ways to kind of crawl your way back to something that uh you know um that uh, to to more solid ground um but we know that works of art can help um whether it's uh, you know one of the things the liturgy knows quite well is music can sometimes do it um, there are times when your spiritual drought is so um, severe, so extreme, so deadening that even the words of, you know, a religious, uh, a religious ritual or um, a worship service can't, can't reach you, but the music can, um, and so on. So, um, you know, the, what you, what you hope for is that what you are, hungry for arrives in time <laughs> Arri right. yeah, totally. arrives right yeah. arrives in time yeah. presents itself is yeah. passed along to you i mean that's one thing about writing sermons which is so great it's just like and so terrifying because I, I was talking to um one of my colleagues and he's like i was writing that sermon at three o'clock in the morning and all of us have had that where you're like 11 30 and you've only written a third of it and you don't even know how the rest of it's going to go and but the one thing about it is that when it's done it's done do you know what I mean it's so you have a chance to like like keep editing things ad infinitum and you know come up with a different edition later on but um you know as you were talking about your friend who was just kind of just um in in a struggle over like a like a technical question about meter i, I wonder if you can talk a little about i mean I, as, as you were saying that i'm like why didn't i scan atsuro's 
poems properly and you know like, like the little diagrams and all that stuff and I didn't do that but I, I I just I had just a very organic experience of them and knowing you just I think changes like my experience of them so profoundly but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about meter and and how important it's been in your your work and how your your kind of how you use meter has changed perhaps over over the course of your time as a poet right well um I guess the first thing I should say is that I'm the kind of autodidact of all autodidacts. So, you know, I'm very much a late bloomer. I published my first book late. I'm very much self-taught. I've never been in the, you know, MFA industrial complex, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so everything I've learned in, and of course, all the gaps therein are my fault, are my doing. So I have kind of wandered around in the desert um, blindly um, and tried to educate myself about how to make the sounds I want to make. Um, so uh, I wouldn't say meter per se in the way that a formalist poet would understand it. I wouldn't say that that has been so important to my practice. On the other hand, um, Shakespeare is my God and yeah. Seamus Heaney is my God and yeah. Gerard Manley Hopkins is my God and so on. Um, I'm doing something which I understand to be much more, as you say, organic or somatic or um, in very much in the body. And I'm very much kind of feeling my way through it. Um, and it is, you know, I'm going on nerve and viscera. That's really the best way I can put it. Um, and it, I, I know it's right when I know it's right. Um, there isn't, you know, Seamus Heaney talks a lot about the kind of the workings of the inner ear. And he's really talking in every dimension, spiritual, physical, uh, generational, etc. Um, and that is very much how I understand the process to work. Now, in terms of change, um, I was, I found myself saying this um, to an, a radio interview a few days ago. Um, I think if there are changes, and of course, um, I'm the last person you could, you should ask, but um, if there are changes in my work, um, in my first book, the language is very, very saturated and very intense and very headlong. Um, there was a, a kind of very strong drive to not tell because um, mm. there's a great deal of abuse and trauma and terror and all kinds of other things kind of embedded in childhood. And that speaker couldn't know those things if he did know those things in the way that the front of your brain knows something, it would be fatal. So he couldn't know them, um, as I understand it. He couldn't know them, um, but he could make music about them. Um, and so there's, so the, the result of that is a music or a line or a, uh, a poetics, if you like, that, is headlong, it's super saturated, it has really intense sensory sightedness. Um, you know, I heard, I, I was telling someone the other day, it's a little like drinking from a fire hose um, in places. And in this new book, in this new work, um, I, I felt a different feeling, which is to say, a little more direct about what what the feeling is a little less, um, a little less saturated and a little more kind of balanced or measured, or even I, I might even say kind of classical proportions. Um, and there's a lot of kind of, there are a lot of kind of iambic runs of single syllable words and other things like that. And then there's a pacing question, as you probably noticed in the way the poems look on the page, instead of kind of a headlong rush of verbal energy, things are paced out and paused and paced out and paused and balanced and balanced and counterbalanced. 
Yeah, I don't I, know if I, that answers your question. No, I, I thought, I, there's, there's so many questions I had, and you're answering some of the ones that I just didn't even ask yet, but was going to. But yeah, I, I, I love Romy's order. And, and, and you're right. It's, I, I think part of it is like all of us were children once, and, and we all, um, there was a kind of mysteriousness to the adult world, which you just do such an amazing job of capturing, of just, you know, where, where you see everything in such a fresh way. And you don't have the labels that adults would use to put on everything. And you're right. So trauma labels that we all have from the psychology workshop, it just that those don't exist in there, it, which is so good because it helps us to experience it more as an individual thing rather than classifying it in a, and putting it in a box along with a, what a zillion other people have experienced. But yeah, that's part of, I mean, yeah, that's part of what I love about your, your work for sure. You know, one of the things that I, I, I think a lot about just is just the way that Japanese culture and words and tradition and experiences informs your work. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that too. I just feel like that's a huge part. If, if herd horde is just like a bunch of like ways of understanding and talking and sounding out the world, I, I just feel like you have a huge reservoir over in, in that part of in that part of your 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 tradition. Yeah, um, it's interesting the Japanese part of me and how that gets worked out in the in the you know in in my work. So, you know, um, growing up in the South Carolina Low Country for our listeners. Um, I grew up in the South Carolina, uh, South Carolina Low Country, a coastal area. My mother was obviously an immigrant from Japan. She learned to speak English really from various people who were by turns illiterate or mildly literate or um, doggedly uh, avoiding of the literate, et cetera. Um, and very, very inventive and expressive speakers, however, and thinkers. So that that must be said. But um, and we knew very little uh, when I was growing up. We knew very little about my mother's Japanese life. Yeah. So it the way in which it works out in the work is kind of true to life, which is to oh, say, yeah. there's a little bit of it, and it has potency. In right, the way the cooking, that in the dress, in the practices, yeah. in the way that your mom will look at things like from a totally different angle than all the people around her. You know, that definitely, I think there's a way in which cultural is passed down matrilineally. Do you know what I mean? And so there is a way in which our mother's culture has an undue influence on us. And you're right, but there's still so much that's kind of mysterious that is unknown. You know, um, right. I, I imagine language too. You probably had some words that she would use and you would use. And, you know, there wasn't anybody else at school who was going to understand those words. Well, <laughs> you know, not very much, not very much. I mean, back to something you said a second ago about culture being passed down, you know, there is, we do have the phrase mother tongue. Yes. Right. Yeah. So imagine if your mother tongue, you know, in the new book, there's a phrase, my, my Flint mama was no lamp to me nor well. I mean, imagine if your mother was not a lamp to you yes. nor well, right? Pretty serious situation, right? Yeah. So, um, and imagine that your mother tongue is one in which, um, the, the actual mother may not speak her tongue. Yeah. So as when we were growing up, I think my dad's attitude was he was a southerner. He was from Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, I think his attitude in 19 in the 1960s, um, when the family was beginning to grow, um, I think his feeling was, I brought this woman here, maybe no one will notice. <laughs> <laughs> She's Japanese. We just will not mention it, right? So, um, so she had an American name, and uh, there's no, you know, there's no mention, and so we learned everything kind of sideways. Uh, you know, learned the names for things. So we did not speak Japanese. Yeah. Um, my mother went for many, many, many years without speaking Japanese, and so some of what I know I've imported as a quote unquote, educated person, you know, I left home, I went to school on my Japanese heritage, and so on. So, uh, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, the one thing uh, uh, that what you said reminded me of is, 
You know, we did do a lot of, and I know you've heard stories like this with other immigrant families, but I did a lot of translating for my mother. Right, of course. So, you know, so talk about code switching. So yeah. we would go to the school. I would be in trouble inevitably. Yeah. Um, we would go to the school. The principal would tell my mother what the thing was that I did that was annoying. And then I would have to explain it to my mother. Yeah. And then my mother would say some things and they sound perfectly fine to me and I understand them. And then I would have to explain them back to the principal. So you can see what that does to one's language center. I mean, if you were going to go to poet school, <laughs> Right. Being yeah, a kind of being a kind of nine year old translator yeah, is a pretty, exactly. pretty good poetry school. Totally. When people ask you what your first translation was, you'll have to be able to tell right. them about right, yeah. Hiram Johnson Elementary School or whatever right. it was called. Right. And it's funny to think of your mom. I mean, she may have been brilliant in terms of how she expressed herself in Japanese. And there's just no way that your father would ever know or you would ever know or, you know, that you ever you'll ever realize. So, there, you know, that's an interesting thing, too, that, that she could make it here. You know what I mean? Oh, completely. And, you know, the thing about everybody that I knew growing up, um, and again, great training for doing what I do. Um, you know, my mother is very, very brilliant. Um, and she, you know, she's a kind of bricolure of, of English, um, right? So she takes a thing that she hears and she makes do as best she can. And then she staples to it a couple of other phrases that she knows and so on. And she ends up being massively, um, you know, expressive, but you might not, under, you might not hear it as English necessarily, you know, and the same with my father, my father, you know, um, didn't, you know, he didn't graduate from high school when, you know, he went in, into the Navy, just the best, most riveting, hilarious storyteller and Jerry rigor of language. And again, taking, you know, there's a line in the new book, stake your scrag of ground with what you've got, yeah. you know, you kind of do with what you've got and you make yourself known. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'd say about this kind of line of thought is, um, you know, the thing, uh, the thing that I think Japanese does to my work is I, I became very interested in Japanese poetry, in haiku, in renga, which is a linked verse form. And one of the things that that does to the um, fire hose we were talking about, <laughs> the fire hose of language, is it, it uh, uh, reduces it, right? It brings a, minimize, a minimalist kind of point of view. You know, there's that great thing that Basho, the great haiku master, from the 17th century said, is there ever any good in saying everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a tonic force. I understand it to be a tonic force, or at least in my fancy, in my imagination, I imagine on the Southern side, we've got the garrulous storyteller on the porch of the general store. Absolutely true to my experience. And then we've got Basho saying, yeah, but could you not do it in seven syllables? Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly, and that's what's so powerful about Romy's order is that it's so compact too. I mean, when you have that child's perspective, that's you know part of what you're getting. Um, I, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about Herd Horde, like you know, where did it come from and, and kind of what some of these story, stories mean to you and just how it came into being. I remember you know, talking to you about it as you're at different stages of, of it reaching its final form. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that to tell our listeners that you probably heard me complaining about how it was going nowhere um, at various <laughs> points. Um, and that's what pastoral care is for. Right. Um, right. To get you out of that rut. But, um, you know, there's a. Um, I after finishing the last book, I understood there to be. Um, a very strong strain in the first book of 
what I call herds or herd tales, you know, what the village says, what the neighbors say, what the chorus, you know, the chorus that grows up around you, what they say, um, the stories that get passed down. And indeed, in that book, some of that is quoted um, and it ends up being sprinkled through as a kind of seasoning. And as I started to embark on a second project, um, I, I really felt that a lot of the, there were a lot more stories, first of all, there are a lot more stories or tales in the, in the parlance of the book or tales, and that they were very old tales that had been passed down and passed down and retold and retold in a kind of endless game of telephone where the story shifts a little bit and the tall tale tellers kind of embellish it and, you know, it gets all passed down. And one day it just struck me, and it really was one day, I was making notes. One day it struck me, this is the core of everything. This is the core of who I am. You know, Toni Morrison says in her Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize speech, um, narrative is radical. And she means it in both senses of the word, R-A-D-I-C-A-L and R-A-D-I-C-L-E. It okay. is radical. It is originary. She says, it is making us, it is creating us as it is being created, right? So, so there's one sense that these stories, these tales were everything, they were at the core of who one is, the core of who I am, the core of who you are. So the stories you got told by your mama are how you made the world. They are the forms. They are the originary forms. They're the rudimental forms. They are the basis for who you are. Um, and then I understood in that flash, that one second on that day, that it's the core of the world, that we are, as every griot will tell you, as every, as every um, Native American storyteller will tell you, as your wife Heidi's uh, Hawaiian ancestors will tell you, the stories are the core of the world. Right. So I wrote a little lyric which appears at the beginning of the book that says what came to seem to him the core, the pulsing core, that is to say, with a pulse, still alive, ING, hmm? the pulsing core is this wefted, warped mesh. Right. The, the book said, the poem says, a lit meat mesh of herds. So think about that a lit meat mesh of herds, so it is inlit, right, glowing, present to us, a meat mesh, which means humans must be involved or beings must be involved, right, so it's intermingling with us, of herds, what tales he gnawed like seeds, like sparks, those are all originary things, right, like seeds, like sparks, live ember words, Lucernal core, here we are back at the lamp, lucernal core, red, gold, filaments, sting, and thrum. So then that last bit is interesting, and I wanted to bring it up because, you know, in our, in our run up to this in the promotion that the cathedral's been doing, you know, there's, there was language like, can, can poetry heal us, can words heal us? Uh, yes and no, is what I'd say to that, which is to say, poetry is a force, it is an isness, it is a, you know, it is an element of nature, it exists, it's real. And like everything else in nature, as the poem says, it stings and thrums, yeah. right? So poetry isn't, or literature, or words, aren't by their nature a good, but they can be, right? And they also can be, as we know all too well in our current moment, they can be destructive as well, right? They can be used to, for, for you know, um, they can be used for ill. Yeah. Um, but that um, the, the wonderful thing about poetry is the, the real poetry admits you know, the rightness and the wrongness, right? The yes and the no are held in the hand at the same time. Um, 
and brings them into, you know, if we're lucky and it's a real work of art and so on, it brings the yes and the no of the world into balance. So stings and thrums. It can be beautiful music. It's also going to have, you know, it's going to, it's going to poke you, you're going to feel it and so on. So anyway, back to your question about, about the stories and the tales. So I thought um, all of these tales and stories are at the core of everything. They're at the core of who we are. They're at the core of all consciousness. And, um, and I could make a book basically based on the idea, uh, the ancient idea of the word hoard the word horde, which is, you know, going all the way back before Beowulf, the place where our, Seamus Heaney calls it the strong room of vocabulary, right? Everything you ever heard, every tale you heard, every phrase, every lovely piece of music, every rhyme, everything is in there. And we draw from it. You draw from it when you make your sermon week after week after week for many, many years, you draw from the hoard and you then make a new pattern out of the things that got kept in the hoard because of the patterns made by them in the past. And so I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could kind of change the definition a little bit of word hoard to herd hoard? So that was the dream that everything I ever heard all those wonderful tales, all the little phrases, the little salty phrases, all the little weird Japanese words that I kind of caught out of the corner of my ear, all of that could go in the stew. And then we might be able to figure out what the musical traces of that are and make a mesh, you know, a new mesh for today. So you know, that's uh, a Micah, long answer, but no, no, it was so good. I loved hearing it. You know, Micah, our son, um, basically took all the sermons I'd ever written, you know, a th- over a thousand sermons and put them in the computer and told me what words I use. Oh, it was, wow. It was, it, was, it was really interesting. It was, it was really interesting to see what things keep recurring over and over again, um, which parts of the word hoard. Uh, or the herd horde are like closest to the door so that I just go and open the door exactly. and grab them really quickly. <laughs> yeah, those word cloud things, they can sometimes be, um, you know, they're sometimes amusing, sometimes quite depressing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you look at you look at the, the word cloud that Amazon or something has made of you oh, and yes. you think, oh God, is that I what know. I am? It kills yeah. me completely. Yeah. It's like you seeing know, a picture of yourself. It's like seeing a bad picture of yourself. The, the um, one, I would love it if you could read Thicket for me. That's the okay. last poem in, um, in Herd Horde. I'm just going to show everybody what the cover looks like uh, right there. Yep. Yeah, I, there's so many ones that I wanted you to read. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if it would it'd be totally rude if I just went over to your house and just said, hey, could you, could, you, could you read me diorama or could you read map or could you read skin? <laughs> well, I'm happy to read any of them, but I'm so happy that you asked about Thicket because in fact, we can tell our listeners, um, Thicket, um, Thicket is really informed. Uh, it, it's very it's very intertextual in that it, it, it acknowledges certain debts from the horde. Um, and I'll talk about what those are, but another hidden river feeding this poem is really my, as it were, spiritual support. So Malcolm, uh, is present in this poem as a presence and was when I wrote it. Um, And also a wonderful thinker, poet, a brilliant person, Christian Wyman, Mm -hmm. who is at Yale Divinity School in the, in the, um, in the Institute of Sacred Music. It was an editor um, of my poetry in Poetry Magazine when he was the editor for 10 years. And he, this poem was written for his last issue of Poetry Magazine. Um, and so it was, you know, kind of my two spiritual advisors were very much uh, sitting on, on the right hand and the left shoulder. That, yeah, that's very much of an honor to be put in the same um, category as Christian, Christian Wyman. So I'll give you some notes about this poem. So uh, Yawpin is a kind of spiky holly bush kind of coastal plant. Um, there is a word in here. Crample, which is a mashup of my own 
with Cramble, which is to creep along the ground, uh, you know, uh, along the forest floor and trample. So Crample, um, there is a word in here, which everybody knows, but they don't necessarily know they know it, which is lumen and a lumen you'll see on your light bulb packages. Um, it will say 1000 lumens, or it's a unit of light, um, which is a handy thing to have if you're going to write a, a quasi spiritual poem, a unit of light. Um, it is also the lumen is also the 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 negative space in a tubular structure. So if you think about the stem of a plant, the inside part, so you've got the outside part, right, which you can see, but the inside part where all the guts are in the stem of the plant, that's the lumen. Or in one of your blood vessels, the hollow part is the lumen. Um, and then there is a, there is a quotation from uh, Amy Clampett um, here, um, having to do with a little room for turmoil. And then the last thing that I'll say is that there are two characters mentioned. Um, and one of the characters appears in the book. And indeed, she appears in my first book, too. She keeps cropping up. She pulls a card around. Right. And right. right. And she's of uh, immense utility to the spiritual life of the community. And she pulls a cart around. And so she appears in this poem. She makes a little cameo. And there's another cameo by a boy who had been pressed into kind of unfortunate tobacco slavery. And he appears in this poem. Um, and so. Uh, and then finally, the poem has a little head note. And that comes from a medieval Irish work, which was translated by Seamus Heaney. And that head note is, it's juices that have greened my chin. So the juices of the thicket. So thicket. We come gnawed by need on hands and knees. As a creature nosing, grubble seeks a spring. As bendy spined as bandy snakes through salt shrub, yalpin, needle break. For darkling green, for thorn surround, this absorbing, quaggy, crample ground. Of briar canes intervolved with kudzu mesh and mold. Of these convoluted vines we grasp to suck, to taste the pith, the lumen, the cell sap flux, to try to know some sour, sharp something about something. Lumen is as lumen does a little room for turmoil to grow lucid in. Leaf whelmed in here, where Clary sets her cart tongue down and blinks and craves. In here, where Tynan breathes, we grasp to suck, to taste what light. Let loose the bale that bows us down bow down. Wow. Oh, Atsuro, <laughs> I'm so moved. I, I've been reading your poems out loud, you know, for the last week, over and over again, and they're oh. really seeping in. I, and I, I, you know, obviously, you're my friend, and I love you so much. But just even apart from that, I've, I've never heard anything like your poems before, your voice in the poems. And uh, it, it, it's so it's so particular, it's so identifiable. If somebody from the future brought me your, your next book of poems and put it on my desk and it didn't have your name on it, I would know exactly what it was. Um, you know, I, I think so much too. I, I feel like you know, my voice is just so ordinary. It, it's just like, I'm just trying to get whatever is at hand to just say what I... Like I said, it's almost like there, there is that herd hoard. It's like if it's that storehouse that Seamus Heaney talks about, like I, I feel like I only go a few steps in because you know, I'm in such a hurry and it's so near the door. 
um, but I, but I, I long to have a voice that's like more deeply expressive. And, and I wonder if you can talk just, I mean, I'm sure there's young writers who are, who are you know, going to be listening to this broadcast or who are listening to it right now. And I wonder what advice you have just about how you discover that voice. How do you discover that, that, that thing that's so unique? It, 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 I, I wish I could put words in it better, but I, I mean, just even the way that you put two words together and they become something completely different. Um, I wonder if you can talk about how we find our voice. How we find our voice. Well, I'm sorry to say to anybody who wants to write or is trying to write, I'm sorry to say that my particular um, advice, if you will, I mean, I don't feel really qualified to give advice, but if I were going to give advice, it's always quite depressing to most people who hear it, which is to say, it takes forever. Yeah. And I mean, it really is the, I talked earlier about the dream, um, it, it, it is the work of a lifetime. Yeah. And so, um, and, 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 you know, I mean, I, I think because of that, because of that, I mean, and I won't be the first person to have said this, but the first writer to have said this, but if you don't need to write, then please don't, you know, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't need to write, then um, count yourself lucky and go on and do something, you know, useful. The, the thing about writing from my point of view, because again, I didn't feel I had available to me for, you know, all kinds of complicated reasons. Um, I didn't feel I had available to me the tracks that many people do use, which is to say they study it in school and then they right. go and then they get out of their undergraduate and they go to an MFA and then they get an MFA and they have workshops and people look at their work and so on. I'm, I'm sorry to report that, um, and not sorry, by the way, um, I'm sorry and not sorry to report that the way that I have found to be reliable is to wander around in the desert, endlessly blindfolded in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, and what, uh, what, what you get for that is, or what I feel that I have, where I've arrived as a result of that incredibly, you know, uh, bullheaded process, um, uh, is an inconvenient process is um, I feel that I trust, I trust what gets made. So I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I don't really have anything useful to say about finding your own voice, but um, it's a combination of everything that you read. And, you know, when I say going all the way back, all the way back to the beginning of human existence and the words caved on the wall. Yeah. I'm afraid to say I mean it. Um, and in as much as I can in this lifetime, crawl my way all the way back and read everything that was ever written, you know, I would love to be able to do that because that's, that's what, that's the, that's where all the vitamins are. And then you have to, or I have felt that I have to then cross that with some of my dreams or some of my desires or some of my hungers, uh, you know, some of my needs. Um, and, you know, and that's where we get to where we've gotten, um, you know, in a more mundane sense, back to what we were talking about before, I have a lot of examples in my life of people who, whose hearts were full, whose lives were full, whose um, solitudes and distresses were real, um, and they wanted to express them, and they used what they had, right? Uh, yeah. They used what they had, and they banged something together that would work, and I kind of feel like I'm doing that, um, and so I have a great model or a set of models, a series of models, a lifetime of models of, you know, banging two words together. Cause I don't know the, you know, as my father would call them, um, I don't know the $10 word. Yeah. Right. And, right. you know, I didn't go to Yale 
I didn't go to Harvard. I don't, you know. Um, it's so much better to not go to Yale and Harvard and have your have your work read at Harvard and Yale. <laughs> right, <laughs> Let me just say right. that. But you know, it's funny. I mean, even when you said that, I was just like you're talking about reaching back, and and you, when you said back to the beginning, I was just thinking about that kind of the rosy fingered dawn, you know, in Homer's Iliad. You know, and there are times when I'm you know riding my bicycle to the cathedral. It's six thirty in the morning, and and that's it. And I, I and I and I and you're right. Those 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 words are so deep in us, and so and. I, I wondered, um, you know, uh, well, I had two questions. One was, do people say, Atsura O'Reilly, that's just like so-and-so, or Atsura O'Reilly is in the same category as so, such and such. Like, are, are there people that other people compare you to? Um, I get Hopkins a lot. Yeah. Um, and that's you know, why that, I, I swear it, that's the reason I brought this. Yeah, yeah. I went downstairs like 10 minutes before you came on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... The thing about Hopkins is, as I told someone at some point, um, you know, Hopkins is a strong drug yeah. and um, and you really don't want to, if you're really impressionable and you're just getting your legs, you don't really want to drink him straight. Yeah, yeah. Right. No so <laughs> I have always, I have always in the early days, um, you know, and again, I came to Hopkins completely on my own and kind of felt my way through him all all alone um, and made my own conclusions. But I never drank him straight. Yeah, I I got my Hopkins for many, many years through Seamus Heaney. I got my Hopkins through uh, Elizabeth Bishop, who loved Hopkins. I you know, I kind of sipped him through a couple of layers of gauze before I would let myself get a full face full of it. Um, Cause again, it's a strong drug, but he is, you know, he's magnificent and wonderful. And um, yeah, and I think of all the poems he destroyed and just wonder what those were like. Right. You know, right. You know, um, one of the questions I've been dying to ask you and so many times, it's just not appropriate when we're just kind of hanging out is um, Northern California and how people talk in Northern California. Um, you know, South Carolina, if, you know, I've been in South Carolina, um, you know, I, I, Greenville and all the different, like, um, I was on a, the project was basically, um, I was a management consultant and I was doing work on um, paper mills, basically. So think of what paper mills in South Carolina are like. Um, but, but reading your work, it, it reminds me of being there. The, the place is like so deeply in what you're writing. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what the, like how, like how um, Northern California words or ideas or subjects or topics, like what's, a, what, like what's the Northern California version of that? Um, well, I, I'll say that- next Roth, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course there are extraordinary Poems, poets, poets exactly. uh, you know, poets in California and there's a rich tradition from Robinson Jeffers. Right, Robinson in, Jeffers. You know, exactly. in the past to the present day, you've got- uh, you know, Kay Ryan, you've got Ina uh, Kubridge, Ro I mean, all the way Ro back to the 19th century. Yeah, exactly. Robert Haas, et oh, cetera. Yeah, Robert Haas. Um, I would say, I mean, uh, the, the interesting thing to me about um, regional language is, and, you know, it's somewhat sad and people have been talking about it for, you know, low these 75 years or something since the advent of, uh, you know, since color TV came to yeah, town. Yeah, totally. That's exactly right. what happened. Um, so, and, you know, and there's a lot of talk about this in the UK as well, that regional accents then get kind of paved, paved over or kind of smoothed away. And, you know, um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is, of course, not only regional differences and preserving those, and I think that's one of the jobs that a poet can do to be useful, is to kind of remember us to our languages, right? And remember us to all the various languages. And, you know, of course, I'm thinking a lot about the languages and the Englishes of people who are not tremendously educated yeah. and, you know, and not bookish people and so on. So, um, I'm very interested in preserving those. And, uh, you know, ever since I've, ever since I left home, you know, I left home to go to college, but I stayed in the state and then I left and went to the Midwest. And it was as if I'd gone to another country. Yeah. I thought, what is this language they are speaking? 
Um, and the sounds were very, very foreign to me. And, you know, in Chicago, where I was living, of course, there are many, many different ones. And that was fascinating to the formation of the ear. And then coming to California, where I'd say most of what I hear, because it's hard to find a native, though I live with a native. Yeah, um, right. It's hard to find a native. Um, so it ends up being a mix of stuff. And then kind of like television or the internet or so on, it's kind of smoothed over and paved over. So one thing my work could be doing is kind of keeping the spiky particulars alive. Yeah, it's funny that, you know, there, yeah. I, I've always been in the kind of the process of hiding my regional accents. Do, do you know what I mean? And so there's just some, some words that I say in a different way than other people around me. I'm trying to hide those. And, and, and you know, I did a lot of that when I was younger. Oh, I can imagine. Oh my god! And then well, I was, decided to embrace it. Yeah, I, I wanted to like talk about racism and your your, your growing up experience too, because that must. I mean, there's so many questions around that. But in California, the Central Valley was settled more by people from the South, and the coastal regions were settled more by people in the New England and Midwest. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it's it, it's in the language. But your light television has just changed us so much. Yeah. I wonder um, if you can um, talk a little bit about just like what your writing process is. Like, like how do the words come? And are, are you out walking in the Presidio and you have a little piece of paper and pencil and you quickly jot something down? Or do you just sit at the desk and say, I'm not going to get up until I'm five hours from now when I um, finish this problem that I'm working on? Or you know, what does it look like? Well, what it mainly looks like um, is, you know, there's a lot of time on what I call my raft, which is kind of a day bed in my studio. Yeah, so a <laughs> lot of time on that. The doctors would have a field day with, you know, because we're not supposed to sit so much. And I always look for the study in which they say, well, what if you lie down for most of your life? What, <laughs> you know, what are the health implications of that? So there's a lot of lying down in that position and lying down in the bathtub. Um Sorry to have to report that to you, but that um, is what it looks like. But more seriously, um, you know, first of all, it takes forever, as I said, and it's a yeah. very, very long process. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting, fun, preliminary stuff that doesn't, doesn't really make its way into the poems for a very, very long time, but drawing of pictures and drawing of graphs and mapping out things. And in this case, mapping out a world and where does the river go and how, yeah, right. And who lives along the river and what does up river and down river mean and all of that. Um, you know, have you ever seen the, uh, the Faulkner maps of Oh yeah, uh, right. Of his special county, which yes, I won't try to pronounce because exactly. I always get it wrong. Yeah. Um, and there are other writers who have done a similar thing. So that's fun, interesting. And, and then lots of kind of um, strange looking, um, you know, uh, graphs and charts and funny pictures and that sort of thing, which hopefully will be burn so no one could ever see them. And then I use a lot of index cards. So you know, a little phrase or a little, a little snatch of language and, you know, and then that goes on forever and ever and ever. And then, and then I get a line, a first line. And, you know, I'm not, um, there are that you were going to get into the weeds here on writing practice, but, you know, there are a lot of people who write in drafts. So they write, a as they call it, a shitty first draft. Right, and right. then they, and then they revise and then they revise. And I think, well, how, how interesting that sounds. I don't do it that way. So I write a first line and then I live with that and mutter it to myself and record it and repeat it and repeat it and sing it and chant it and so on. And then one day something attaches to it. So it's a little bit like if you decided you were going to be a barnacle maker. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, totally. And so you just attach yourself to the leg of the pier yeah. and then you let the waters work upon you and then you wait for an eon and then you get a barnacle. It's kind of like that. So I'll get a first line and then I'll get a second line. And then, of course, the second line comes and that's a day for a ticker tape parade. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, right, completely. If I get two lines <laughs> and then two lines happen and then I live with that for ages and ages and ages. And then I, and so it goes. 
and so that's that's you kind know, of it's funny because I I, um, I I used to go to the Farnsworth Poetry Room at Harvard just to study, and I, I have such I, I sometimes when I'm upset. I'll just imagine I'm sitting in one of the wing back chairs in that space. And, and what I liked about it was they had so many recordings of like Robert Frost and people amazing like that. Amazing stuff. You yeah. know, it's amazing. And I, 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 I never even thought about this, but, you know, it seems like, a, like especially for you, it's like I, um, having audio, having audio, the audio book just seems like it would be very valuable. Do, do you know what I mean? It's just... And yeah, I wonder yes. if you can talk a little bit about that, just like where we are in terms, because that's completely possible. I mean, I, like, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate these so much because I, I can leaf weight my way through them and just scrolling through your voice would be a little bit harder to do. But there definitely would be a, like hearing you say these, it, it, it would th that would be very helpful. Yes. So number one, I love a printed book and, you know, I have I have a real. Um, what would we call it? Bibliophilia. You know, I want to eat the book. I want to lick it. You know, it's a thing yeah. from childhood. You know it well. Um, so I love a printed book. And with poetry in particular, you're right. Um, the sound of the poems is um, really, really exciting, thrilling. Not everyone loves it. Not everyone cares about it. I happen to care about it a lot. Um, you know, for the first book, I made a little janky homemade very, very um, uh, oh, yeah. coupled together kind of uh, right. what I called an audio site. And it was really all the poems in the book and audio tracks. And it was free and you could download it. And lots of people did. It was really fun. And then they would write to me saying that they or reviewers would write and say, boy, that was wonderful. Right. So I would love to have an audio book of this book. So anybody who's listening, any publishers of audio books, um, from Malcolm's lips to God's ear, you yeah. know, um, we hope that can happen. Um, oh, speaking great. of that, I wondered, um, I asked about this before we got on, on the air. Um, I wondered if I could read a poem by someone else. Yeah, that'd be great. I would love to hear that. We have, um, that'd be super. That'd be a great, great way to, great, great way to move forward. Yeah. So I wanted to think about a little bit about, again, what we were talking about in the run up, which is, the possible, let us say, healing power of words or the possible role of poetry in our year of healing at Grace. Um, you know, and as I said, you know, I'm skeptical about just making a blanket statement, right, that poetry or art, literary art can be in and of itself healing. But on the other hand, in the sense that it admits the yes and the no and the rightness and the wrongness of the world, it can be quite quite something, right? And I want to no. add one thing, Atsuro. When you talk about childish childhood experiences, like what the linoleum floor looked like, I, I feel less alone in the universe for having had those thoughts myself. Right. Do you know what I mean? They're right. so exactly. odd and particular and idiosyncratic. I'm just like, okay, Atsuro and I are both weird. It's not just me, the two of us, right. Right. we're not right. alone. <laughs> right. Well, you know what Bernadette Mayer says? She says, Every, everywhere in the world has everything there is to look at. <laughs> oh, I love that. Right. So, so, you know, my linoleum floor, and of course, Blake went there too, Right. Looking at right. the linoleum floor as a child, I can see the world. Exactly. Yeah, is the sense. So this poem, this is a good segue into this poem. This is a poem by a wonderful poet, not well known in the U.S. He's Australian. Um, and he makes a poem here that brings all of our humanness into the poem and just points at it in the way that the haiku masters say to point at, which is to say that. Yeah. So let's look at that. He makes no claims. He just says a thing. And so it's very beautiful. Les Murray um, passed away in the last few years. He dedicated every one of his poetry books to the glory of God. Oh. Um, he was a dairy farmer in New South Wales. He grew up on a dairy farm. So there are lots of resonances with my upbringing in that, you know, he became a lettered person arising from not so lettered people. So this poem is called An Absolutely Ordinary Rainbow. And um, it 
begins, and I'll just give everyone a little hint here, that it begins um, by invoking some place names, and they're like coffee shops in downtown Sydney, okay? And then we're ending off, we're ending up the poem back in downtown Sydney on Pitt Street, right? So place names kind of create a little container for the poem itself. And then the other thing that I'll say, there's a word in the poem called uh, that, that is rhythm, W-R-I-T-H-E-N, as in something that has writhed, right? Something that got twisty. And you'll know exactly what it means when you get there. An absolutely ordinary rainbow. The word goes around Rippon's. The murmur goes around Lorenzini's. At Tattersall's, men look up from sheets of numbers. The stock exchange scribblers forget the chalk in their hands. And men with bread in their pockets leave the Greek club. There's a fellow crying in Martin Place. They can't stop him. The traffic in George Street is banked up for half a mile and drained of motion. The crowds are edgy with talk and more crowds come hurrying. Many run in the back streets, which minutes ago were busy main streets, pointing. There's a fellow weeping down there. No one can stop him. The man we surround, the man no one approaches, simply weeps and does not cover it. Weeps not like a child, not like the wind, like a man and does not declaim it, nor beat his breast, nor even sob very loudly. Yet the dignity of his weeping holds us back from his space, the hollow he makes about him in the midday light, in his pentagram of sorrow. And uniforms back in the crowd who tried to seize him stare out at him and feel with amazement their minds longing for tears as children for a rainbow. Now, some will say in the years to come, a halo or force stood around him. There's no such thing. Some will say they were shocked and would have stopped him, but they will not have been there. The fiercest manhood, the toughest reserve, the slickest wit amongst us trembles with silence and burns with unexpected judgments of peace. Some in the concourse scream who thought themselves happy. Only the smallest children and such as look out of paradise come near him and sit at his feet with dogs and dusty pigeons. Ridiculous, says a man near me, and stops his mouth with his hands as if it uttered vomit. And I see a woman shining stretch her hand and shake as she receives the gift of weeping as many as follow her also receive it. And many weep for sheer acceptance and more refuse to weep for fear of all acceptance. But the weeping man, like the earth, requires nothing. The man who weeps ignores us and cries out of his rhythm face and ordinary body, not words, but grief, not messages, but sorrow, hard as the earth, sheer, present as the sea. And when he stops, he simply walks between us, mopping his face with the dignity of one man who has wept and now has finished weeping. Evading believers, he hurries off down Pitt Street. Oh, that's zero. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you, the, 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 the reading this Sunday is um, mm -hmm. Lazarus' death and Lazarus's sisters come to Jesus and say, if you'd been here and they're so upset and, and you know, the shortest, the shortest verse in, in the whole Bible is Jesus wept. <laughs> uh, the timing is, is couldn't be. See, better. I knew that I'm a good student. No, I didn't. Know Jesus that. wept and so did Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, please join me next week when my guest will be Mark Handley Andrus, Bishop of California. We'll be talking about his new book about the friendship between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, we rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give on gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278, 76278. 
Matsuro, I, I hate that the night is over. I I'm, I hate having to press the leave button. I just want to stay, but we'll have to get to, we'll have to say to be continued. Um, I'm looking forward to very much um, being with you and spending time with you. And I'm grateful for everybody for watching. My, uh, my thanks, Malcolm. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody.